It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. And if I can take a second, before we begin the last question period of 2022, I'd like to wish members on both sides of the House and all Ontarians a safe and happy holiday season with those they hold dear. On behalf of the official opposition, I'd like to also extend my thanks and best wishes to the wonderful staff of the Legislative Assembly for their incredible work on behalf of the people of this province. Yeah. To the amazing cohort of pages, I thank you for your service these past few weeks. I really hope you enjoy the experience. A special farewell to our outgoing Sergeant at Arms, Jackie. Thank you for your service, your commitment to MPPs and the legislative staff. May the next chapter bring you the best that life has to offer. And last but not least, although a number have already said this, it remains to be said, a huge thank you from the NDP caucus to Kevin Modest. Kevin has served our caucus in many capacities over many years. His service to us and to the legislature as a whole has been outstanding. We'll miss him greatly, but we're delighted he will be able to spend more time with his wife and two daughters. That's exactly how it should be. Thank you, Kevin. Speaker, thank you for your indulgence. My question to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said the government is, quote, throwing everything they can at the health care system. But it's clear whatever the Premier is doing is not working. Hospitals are overcrowded, staff are burnt out, and patients are waiting longer than they ever have in our ERs. To the Premier, why didn't this government do more to prevent the current crisis in our health care system? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the member opposite's question because it allows us to once again highlight all of the investments that we have been making. You know, you talk about the challenges that are happening in our hospitals and emergency rooms today. Imagine if we had continued on the path that the Liberals had started us on. Imagine if we hadn't actually invested and ensured that more physicians, more nurses, more PSWs were trained, hired, and actually working in our system. You know, as, as as recently as this morning, we were able to highlight another addition that will ensure that more people are protected by allowing pharmacists to actually not only dispense but give um, Paxlovid. It means that those people, those individuals who are at a bigger risk, higher risk of having um, symptoms that lead to an emergency Response. department or a hospital, now can get that prescription uh, dealt with and filled in a pharmacy. These are the things that we are doing that are making a difference in ensuring that our emergency departments and our hospitals are protected. Supplementary question. The House will remember it was only a few short years ago that the Premier promised Ontarians that he would end hallway medicine. Today, not only is hallway medicine officially returned to Ontario, somehow this government has made the situation worse than it's ever been. Has the Premier forgotten his promise to Ontarians? Minister of Health. And I will say, you know, the individuals who are choosing to work in our health care system are incredible. They have done such amazing work in, frankly, what is a very challenging virus season. But again, I will say, imagine if we didn't have 49 different communities with 911 models of care that allow uh, community paramedicine and paramedics to divert people who choose to willingly go to other pathways other than an emergency room. Imagine if we didn't have orange ambulance um, and having, having virtual medical doctor trials in northern hospitals. You know, we have made lots of investments that have made a difference in communities, and we will continue to make those investments because we understand that as our population increases, they not only need homes, they need hospitals, and they need health care workers. We are doing that work. Thank you, Speaker. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, there's no question that nurses and health care workers are giving a heroic effort to do what they can, but our health care system is in crisis and this minister and this premier are sitting on their hands. Families can't find a hospital to deliver their baby. Local Order. ERs are closing. Staff are having Order. their wages suppressed. And for what? For this government to save a few dollars? You know that is shameful. The government is spending, is sitting on billions of dollars of unallocated funds that can be spent on meaningful investments in health care right now. 
Will this government commit to doing that today? Minister of Health. Now, Speaker, as we embrace the innovation that our health care providers, our hospital leaders are doing to ensure that they get that service um, up and ensure that they have sufficient staff, we have members of your own party suggesting that it is the wrong pathway. We are doing the work. We will continue to make those investments. We've seen in one program alone, the Emergency Department Locum Program, temporary summer locum program has, has been extended. And as as a result, has provided funding for over 230,000 hours of emergency department coverage in 2022. Now, we have, for the first time in decades, ensured that we're going to have two medical schools, one in Brampton, one in, one in Scarborough. We have ensured that residency programs are increased Response. so that individuals who want to practice in the province of Ontario have that opportunity because here. we embrace them here in Ontario. Here, here, here. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The minister has failed to show any objective criteria or evidence to explain how he chose which properties to remove from the Greenbelt. We've looked at each of the 15 areas proposed for remo removal from the Greenbelt trying to understand what criteria the minister may have used. In every single one, we found a strong political or donor tie to the PC party. Can the minister explain this disturbing pattern? The government house leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think the minister has been uh, actually very clear on that. Uh, uh, the lands chosen, of course, are lands that uh, uh, that are uh, either serviced or close to areas that are serviced and in areas that require require uh, housing, uh, Mr. Speaker. Now, it is no surprise to anybody in the chamber that uh, the NDP are against this, Mr. Speaker. They are against people who build homes because they're against people from owning homes. They can't say, as the associate minister pointed out, the NDP will never say the word home ownership. It's just not something that they can grasp, Mr. Speaker. These are the same group of people who voted against long-term care, building long-term care in communities, Mr. Speaker. 60,000 new long-term care beds for 60,000 seniors to get new homes. They voted against it. They voted against the policies that have brought to Ontario the highest number of purpose-built rentals in over 30 years. The highest number because of the policies of this Thoughts? premier, they voted against it. And now, not surprisingly, they're voting against the absolute dream that everybody has when they come to this country, grow up in this country, home ownership, they're against it. Supplementary question. Speaker, Flato Developments is associated with at least two of the areas being removed from the Greenbelt. TAC Construction, owned by the powerful de Gasparis family, is associated with at least four. When Bill 39 passes and the government removes the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve from the Greenbelt, the minister will transfer nearly two-thirds of a billion dollars worth of public wealth to this powerful family of landowners and PC donors. Why is the minister favouring these particular landowners and developers over others? The Social Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, it's only the NDP that doesn't seem to understand that we're in a housing crisis in the province of Ontario. And we don't know why they don't, because Order. Ontarians told us this in the last election. They told us this in the last municipal election. Every single person that was running for office was told that housing is a big issue, but somehow it's not a big issue to the NDP. In fact, they'll oppose housing all along the way, Mr. Speaker, through one initiative, the outgoing mayor. The incoming mayor, the current mayor, have said, we need homes, Mr. Speaker. Over 50,000 homes are going to be created as a result of this one initiative because of the great work of this Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Mr. Speaker. So once again, we'll be very clear, as the NDP continues to say no to housing Response. on this side of the House and with the members on this middle who continue to shrink them on the other side, we'll continue to fight for Ontarians for housing, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. Speaker, in her 2021 report on land use planning, the Ontario Auditor General noted how the minister Order. favored certain developers over others when deciding who should or should not get a minister's zoning order. Seven developers received multiple MZOs. The two who received the most were Flato Developments and TAC Construction, the same developers that the minister has favored with multiple removals from the Greenbelt. The Auditor General warned, and I quote, such a pattern 
opens up the MZO process to criticisms of conflict of interest. End quote. Given the minister's pattern of preferential treatment for Flato and the de Gasparis family, why shouldn't the public suspect a conflict of interest with his Greenbelt decisions? Social Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I thank my uh, colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear. Unlike the previous government and supported by the NDP along the way, Mr. Speaker, we're not in the business of pitting people against one another. We're in the business of working in collaboration Opposition with everyone to, to make sure we build homes, Mr. Speaker. Housing is a priority for us. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll just, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. I'll tell you, I'll read a quote from an accredited economist, Mr. Speaker. Dr. Gilzo, Mr. Speaker, had this to say in response to comments on Bill 23. Dr. Gilzo, who, by the way, I should add, is the policy advisor to the future leader of the NDP, had this to say, Mr. Speaker. Order. It's disappointing, but not surprising to see municipalities come out so hard against one of the most effective pieces to, uh, to lower prices in Ontario's housing Spons? legislation, Mr. Speaker. He continued to say that the charges introduced, the development charges under Bill 23, are excellent policy, Mr. Speaker. It should have meaningful price effect. Mr. Speaker, we agree with experts. We need more housing. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Encampments are growing across Ontario. Mental health for Ontarians is worsening, and this government has no plan. In June of this year, the Big Mayor's Caucus called on the Premier to personally host an emergency meeting to address the homelessness, mental health, and addictions crisis facing cities across Ontario. That's six months ago. Why has the Premier not personally set up a date for the emergency meeting with the Big Mayor's Caucus to come up with an immediate and funded plan to address mental health and addictions crisis in Ontario? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question, but I don't know where the member has been for the last three years. There is a roadmap to wellness, which is a plan that was developed by this government, backed by a $3.8 billion investment, $525 million in annualized funding, to deal, to deal specifically with mental health in the province of Ontario. So we have a plan, and we have been standing behind the plan and developing, over the lifespan, supports for children and youth, for adults, for people with addictions, building treatment recovery strategies and continuums of care to ensure that anyone gets the support where and when they need it. Not only have we done it in, the, in southern Ontario, but recently a $90 million investment brought us 56 per cent of which invested in northern Ontario, which is 400 new treatment beds, 7,000 new treatment spots. So I don't know where the member has been, but we've been active in ensuring that we build a system for all Ontarians. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Back to the minister. I started off this session by telling the heartbreaking story of Ray Caitlin Roth, who died by suicide. She was a bright, successful, beautiful young woman. Her transition from child to adult in the mental health system went tragically wrong. I've been in contact with the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. I'm grateful that he's met with the family, and I believe that he listened to their pain. Quite simply, Mike and Fiona Roth don't want any other parent to experience this tragedy because it was preventable. Can the minister please share what the government is doing to ensure that mental health care is there when someone has the courage to ask for help and that that care and support is appropriate? And the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Speaker, and I, I thank the member opposite for that question. We've had discussions about the needs of our children and youth, ensuring that we build systems that give the youth the supports where and when they need them. We've invested heavily as a government in developing, uh, at this point, 12 plus 8. There'll be 22 in total, with an additional 8 being slated to develop 
youth wellness hubs that are providing care, both primary care to children and youth, providing them the opportunity to get supports for eating disorders, which under the previous government, we spent more money shipping kids to the United States for help rather than investing in our province to ensure that every child has those opportunities for help. When it comes to things like suicide and other issues that affect our youth, it's a tragedy when we lose even one child. But we've, we Bonds. are making the investments to ensure that the supports are there that are age appropriate and that ensure the kids get the supports where they need them, whether it be in Indigenous communities, rural communities, or in our urban centres. We are making that difference as a government because our Premier and our government believes in. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Brock. Hey, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. <laughs> Many entrepreneurs and workers choose to plant their roots in my riding of Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, for many reasons. With a high quality of life and ample opportunities, there's no shortage of reasons why it's one of the best places to operate and grow a business. With the billions of dollars in investments that the government has been attracting across the province, my constituents want to know that they are get also getting a fair deal and the government is there to help their businesses stay competitive. Speaker, can the minister explain what our government is doing to support businesses, namely manufacturers, in my writing? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Job Creation. Ontario cities are the most competitive places to invest and grow. One reason for their success is our government lowering the cost of doing business by $7 billion annually. And that has resulted in record investments being made. TS Manufacturing in Lindsay invested $5 million and added 25 jobs and upskilled jobs. We invested $750,000 to help support this local company by supplying cutting-edge sawmill and mining equipment. Colonial Log and Timber in Lindsay. They invested $1.3 million to double their log and timber framing manufacturing with help of $195,000 from our government. They're creating jobs and gaining a competitive edge, accessing new Response. global markets. Speaker, all this is because Ontario is open for business. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for all his great work, and he can come to my riding any time. <laughs> and it's great to hear that the people in Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, have not been forgotten by the government. And it's also great to see that after years of Liberal and NDP governments making business costly and expensive in Ontario, investments and small business startups have roared back to life under this government. Speaker, to keep this momentum going, we need to ensure that entrepreneurs have everything they need to be successful and to remain competitive on the world stage. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the minister to elaborate on what our government is doing to support entrepreneurs who are looking to start and grow their business. Minister of Economic Development. After years of Liberal and NDP war on business, our government is now supporting entrepreneurs with everything Order. they need to succeed. We are assisting entrepreneurs with support from a broad range of regional and small business Order. centers. Kawartha Lakes Small Business Centre received $400,000 in addition to the almost $80,000 for their summer company and their starter company plus programs for young entrepreneurs. Speaker, close to 30 area businesses received $72,000 in digital transformation grants to put their businesses online. Our government eliminated the red tape, unaffordable hydro rates and taxes that the Liberals and NDP piled on to small business. Order. This is exactly what small businesses Response. needed to ignite their entrepreneurial flame. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Ottawa South, come to order. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mental health care is not getting any better in our communities. Just last week, it was announced that Hamilton City Council had to cut staff from our mental health and addictions program because this government froze their budgets. The wait lists for treatments in Hamilton are staggering, ranging from six months to multiple years, and this move will only be worse. 
I did not realize that cutting program capacity was part of the government's roadmap to wellness. So I'm asking, will the Premier commit to refunding programs so people in my community can get the services they need when they need them? Minister, Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm surprised. We are investing $525 million in new annualized funding each and every year in the province of Ontario to provide the support to everyone across the province of Ontario, including Hamilton. I mean, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm always surprised when I hear the opposition speaking about investments and, and the lack of investments by our government. But when we came here, we came as a government with all kinds of shortages as a result of previous government decisions, whether it was the Liberals deciding to send, spend money to send Order. people $10 million, to be exact, for 127 people to get eating disorder help in the United States, or the NDP cutting 13% of the mental health beds in the province of Ontario under their leadership, 9,645 hospital beds shut Order. down. They created a doctor shortage by capping medical school enrollment. They uh, said no to more acute Response. mental health care and cut $53 million from Ontario psychiatric hospitals. And they voted no over and over again every time we've tried to make investments to improve the situation in the province. So I don't understand why it is. Thank you. Yep, the next question, actually the supplementary question, I should say, under the London North Senate. Speaker, through you, clearly the associate minister and this government are standing behind a plan that is, not, that is coming up short. The CMHA indicates a quarter of Ontarians are seeking mental health support. That's one in four. Jordan Thomas of the London Centre for Trauma Therapy says, we've seen a lot of depression, a lot of hopelessness, a lack of vitality, a loss of optimism about the future. Will this government increase funding and expand OHIP coverage so Ontarians get the mental health care that they need? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I reiterate, we started with a huge deficit when we first came into government. This is the first government that actually created a portfolio so that there is someone that has their eye on investments that are made across the government. Mr. Speaker, our investments are being made in each and every aspect. And you know, when you start with so many issues that have to be addressed, we're addressing eating disorders. We're addressing virtual care supports that came Order. up as a result of a two and a half year pandemic. We're investing in the far north and providing land based healing to Indigenous communities to ensure that they get the appropriate Order. care where and when they need it. We're investing in withdrawal management which is something that's direly needed everywhere across the province. We've opened up addiction treatment beds. 7,000 treatment spots have been opened yeah. under this government, in addition to what is already here. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. We have a roadmap to wellness that ensures that investments are being made where and when they're needed so that people get the support. Thank you. The member for Toronto St. Paul's and the member for Brampton North will come to order. The next question. The member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Winter storms have a significant impact on the people and the economy of the North. We are just at the start of this winter season, and we've already seen the impact that major snowfall can have on our roads. Road safety is an important concern for Northern and Indigenous communities, especially during the winter months. A few weeks ago, I was pleased to have my motion passed in this House, calling for improved standards for clearing snows on highways 11 and 17. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please explain what our government is doing to act on that motion to make roads in Northern Ontario safer during the winter months? Thank you. Respond, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan, for his great question and also for introducing his motion which remi reminds us that there's always more that we can do to make our roads in the north safer. Speaker, it's no secret that the winter months can be challenging for drivers, especially those in Northern Ontario. We heard loud and clear from Northern Ontarians and members on both sides of this house about the need to improve Northern road safety. And Speaker, we acted. Our government is the first to create a new level of service that requires highways 11 and 17 in the north to be cleared within 12 hours after a winter storm. 
Speaker, that is four hours faster than the previous standard. Ontario has a nation-leading standard in place when it comes to winter maintenance, and we are ensuring Response. that it stays that way. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Just last week, though, sections of the Trans-Canada Highway in the north were forced to close for several hours due to poor driving conditions and collisions. Residents in northern and Indigenous communities deserve certainty when they have ac that they have access to a highway network that will be safe and, more importantly, open following a winter storm. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation please tell us what further actions our government is undertaking to help prevent northern highway closures during winter months? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for his question. All of us in this House share a common goal, and that is keeping Ontario's roads safe for everyone. We have over 1,100 pieces of winter maintenance equipment ready to be, to be deployed within 30 minutes following a storm. In Northern Ontario specifically, our government is installing an additional 14 road weather information stations, including eight along highways 11 and 17, to help our contractors prepare and respond faster to winter weather events. As part of our five-year plan to improve the rest area network, we have also completed six major rehabilitations of rest stops across the north, including at the Manitoba border. Speaker, there will always be exceptional circumstances following a winter storm, but our government is taking action to ensure that our northern Response. highways remain open and safe following every winter weather event. Thank you. The member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. A mother from my community wrote to me recently. Her daughter was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. In October of last year, they got a referral for sick kids. Over a year later, they are still waiting for that appointment. They are far from alone. Tens of thousands of kids are on wait lists for mental health services that can take up to two and a half years. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. How long will the children of this province have to wait before they can get the health care service that they need? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Once again, it's extremely important that we remember we do have a roadmap to wellness that looks at the lifespan and the delivery of services that are age-appropriate for each and every individual in the province of Ontario. We know that children and youth need accessible and reliable services if they're going to grow into healthy adults. That particular situation is unfortunate, and it is something that I have my eye on to ensure that the system is built. The $3.8 billion over 10 years is looking at investing in the different term, uh, periods of time during the lifespan to ensure that the supports are there. Since 2019, $130 million has gone to children and youth mental health services. And this, the roadmap slates another $170 million to be spent over the next three years. Of the $194 million that we invested during the pandemic-related emergency funding, Response. additional funds were put into children and youth supports. And there are stepped-up, stepped-down programs. We've invested for youth uh, wellness camps. We've invested in all uh, one-stop talk virtual walk-in supports, as well, as well as— Thank you very much. Supplementary question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. One of my constituents, I'll call her L, is 15 and suffers from an eating disorder. Like many in Ontario, she doesn't have a family doctor, but she has been referred to the eating disorder clinic at CHEO. However, the clinic is overwhelmed and unable to find her a spot. She doesn't eat for days, but she's not sick enough to be admitted to an overcrowded hospital. Her father worries she needs to be dying before anyone will help her. Elle and her parents are desperate for help. Will this government finally act to ensure that mental and physical health care is available for children like Elle when they need it? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Once again, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Eating disorders is something that is very pronounced that we've noticed over the 
pandemic, and is something that we need to look at. This is something that we believe is as a result of isolation, the school disruption, and the social media exposure. These are things that are impacting on, on, on children and youth. In December of 2021, $8.1 million went to support specialized care for children and youth with these eating disorders. We opened seven beds at CHEO, five at Sick Kids, two at McMaster Children's Hospital. This is in addition to $11.1 million annualized for eating disorder services, 20 treatment spaces in underserved communities like Sudbury, North Bay, and Sault Ste. Marie, 10 new pediatric beds in North York and South Lake, 16 new spaces in Peterborough and Kingston. And in November 2021, we invested another $5.8 million in Sick Kids Hospital easing access to treatment by expanding their outpatient eating disorder program. Mr. Speaker, our government is taking this issue very seriously. Our children are our Response. future, and we need to invest to ensure that children get the support they need where and when they need it in the province. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. And first, I'd like to uh, thank the Premier for this lovely gesture of the inaugural speeches that uh, the new members received. So I'm, uh, that's a point I'm giving you, but now I'm going to have to take away that point in my question. Um, so um, I may sound like a broken record here, and, but I need to because I'm hearing from all my residents and actually all your residents about what? The green belt. And because the government has misread the room on this, on the green belt, you really have. Um, the green belt is full of, thank Order. you very much, um, wetlands and Order. watersheds, areas. Order. Stop the clock. The member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. It was. Restart the clock. Member for Beach East York has the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, so we know the green belt is full of water, wetlands and watersheds, areas that protect our province from devastating flooding by absorbing storm water. As we see more and more natural disasters come our, as a way, as a result of climate change, we know what's going on in Brazil right now. We know what's going on out west, out east. Um, climate change, we should be trying to conserve these areas for all Ontarians. If we pave over them, it puts people at financial and physical risk. The Question. average basement flood Order. flooding is $43,000. My question to the Premier, do you believe that the choice to open up the green belt for development puts Ontario at risk for more flooding? If not, please explain. And the response, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks for the question. Let me be perfectly clear, as we have been the whole time talking about this opportunity to build homes for Ontarians. Wetlands are not going anywhere in Ontario. We are going to continue to protect this important part of our province. We are also going to build 1.5 million homes over 10 years. We are also going to make sure that those homes are protected from flooding and any other natural disasters. We are going to get the job done, Mr. Speaker, both on the home front and on the ecology front. And Ontario is going to be the better for it. And the supplementary question. And we know from your own housing task force that we do not need to go into the green belt to achieve our 1.5 million homes goals, which I'm happy to work with you on, but not in the green belt. And I know all of us here care about farmers. We've heard that over and over again, you know, how they feed us every day, how hard they work. Many of us here are Order. connected to farmers and farm, the farming community. Order. Really getting under people's skin today. I love it. It's my Christmas present to y'all. So my question is, why would we remove Ontario's only agricultural preserve, Duffins Rouge? Why would we remove that if we care so much about farmers and farmland and Question. eating? And will you be able to sleep at night knowing that you bulldozed over our last agriculture preserve? 
I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair. Once again, I'll ask the member for Kitchener-Conestoga come to order. The Premier to respond. Well, thank, thank you so much, Speaker. And I, I want to. I want to thank my former colleague from the City of uh, Toronto. We spent a lot of time together, and I have a great deal of respect. Um, Mr. Speaker, you got to look at the total Greenbelt. We've added 2,000 acres more. Since I've taken office, the Greenbelt has expanded. But what I suggest to a member from Beaches East York, sit down, speak to your colleagues, and why you changed it 17 times. You changed it 17 times. We need housing. There's people in the gallery, there's people right here that are still renting. They're renting. We need to build homes. We need to build 1.5 million homes. We have 300,000 people showing up every single year. Are we going to put them in cardboard boxes? Order. Are we going to put them in mud huts? No, they Order. want a home. They want an affordable Response. home. And, and yeah. Mr. Speaker, that gentleman right there voted 17 times to change the green belt and deducted the green belt. Stop the clock. <laughs> Member for Ottawa South will come to order. <laughs> Member for Ottawa South will come to order, and the Premier will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. The member for Peterborough Kawartha will come to order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Ontario's colleges are critical in helping to provide our students with career-focused education that addresses our province's labor needs and drives our economic prosperity. Ontario's colleges produce graduates that got, go on to create jobs for others, making lasting contributions to their communities and help to attract new investments and opportunities. The Minister's Lifetime Achievement Award and the Premier's Award for college graduates recognizes the tremendous contributions that help to make our province successful. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities speak about the well-deserved recognition of the recent recipients of the Lifetime Achievement Award? Your colleges and universities. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton West for his question. I had the honour of presenting the Minister's Lifetime Achievement Award to two outstanding leaders who continue to make a lasting difference in Ontario's public colleges. The 2022 recipients are Anne Sado, the former president of George Brown College, and Anne was also the first female president of the college, and Mary Lynn Westmoynes, former president and CEO of Georgian College, and also my former boss. So I know firsthand the amazing leadership that uh, Mary Lynn provided to Georgian College. These two exceptional women deserve recognition for their hard work, dedication, and contributions on advancing Ontario's colleges. By acting as ambassadors of the college system, they have made a lasting mark on post-secondary education in our province. It was truly an honour to present them with the Lifetime Achievement Award. In the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. A quality education isn't just a means for a good job, but to a great quality of life. And when our post-secondary institutions like our colleges succeed, we all succeed. Making higher education a top priority is critical to securing the economic success of our province as we move forward. But Mr. Speaker, but while it is a positive that our government acknowledges the great work of our college system, we should also take the opportunity to recognize the great people and students that are in our college campuses. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities elaborate on some of the worthy recipients of this year's Premier's Award for college graduates? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. The remarkable and inspiring graduates on Ontario's world-class colleges shows how our colleges are preparing students with the skills, the knowledge, and experience they need to have rewarding careers, supporting the workforce of today and tomorrow. The Premier's Awards for College Graduates recognizes individuals who have not only demonstrated outstanding achievement within their college experience, 
but who've also made significant social and economic contributions to their communities and beyond. Their incredible achievements, from developing career training programs for young black professionals to adding Canada's Indigenous communities to Google Maps and Google Earth, they are helping to strengthen our economy and make very real and tangible difference in the lives of Ontarians. The recipients of the Premier's Awards are perfect examples of the potential our college students have and why we should all have confidence in every student's future. Speaker, college students are making a lasting Response. impact, and we are so proud of what these incredible young Ontarians are accomplishing. Next question, the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Recently, Grassy Narrows honoured the 20th anniversary of their visionary efforts to protect their homeland from industrial logging and mining. And yet, the Toronto Star reported that this government has granted thousands of gold mining claims and proposes to allow clear-cut logging on the area that Grassy Narrows is protecting. To the Premier, when will this government stop the attacks on Grassy Narrows and start respecting Grassy Narrows' Indigenous protected area? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thanks to sit with the Chief of Grassy Narrows not that long ago. We spoke about the opportunities in their communities, building infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, much needed infrastructure, having a vision, a shared vision for economic prosperity, Mr. Speaker, coming to terms with a reality, a harsh reality, Mr. Speaker, that this government was the first to act on by indexing the pensions from, from the Mercury, Mr. Speaker. We don't need to stand here and feel badly about the work that we do with Grassy Narrows, Mr. Speaker. We continue to work with that community to ensure that they have the same opportunities that other Indigenous communities in the surrounding area have and want in forestry and mining, Mr. Speaker, and in their interests of protecting the land. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, again to the Premier, Grassy Narrows has been clear. They need to protect their land so they can heal their people from the mercury poisoning legacy. Instead, this government continues to give out mining claims to gold prospectors in Grassy Narrows' backyard, causing more fear and anxiety in a First Nation that's already suffered too much. Grassy Narrows deserves safety and deserves a clear answer. Will the government finally withdraw Grassy Narrows' territory from mining and logging, yes or no? Mr. Northern Development. Mr. Speaker, what this government will continue to do is strike an important balance, not just for Grassy Narrows, but the Indigenous communities that, sound, that surround the city of Kenora, Mr. Speaker, both with respect to economic opportunities, the mining sector, and the forest sector. Mr. Speaker, Grassy Narrows is in dire need for community-level infrastructure. We work very closely with them, and I've asked the Chief, we've sat down together to ensure those shared priorities come about. Mr. Speaker, in that community, there is a critical need for uh, places and spaces for young people to go, Mr. Speaker, and this is the kind of thing that we're working on. The Indigenous communities that share Treaty 3 land with Grassy Narrows are excited about opportunities both in mining, forestry, and, Mr. Speaker, local infrastructure so that prosperity is a shared value and a shared opportunity once and for all in the Kenora District. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Flamborough, Landbrook. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. Recently released EQAO results confirm what parents already know. Children excel when they are in class and are able to participate in school life. <laughs> Keeping our children in the classroom, as our government has done, is critical. We know that the disruptions of the past few years have resulted in learning loss particularly among our youngest students. Through you, Speaker, to the Minister of Education, how is our government helping our youngest students recover from disruption to in-class learning? Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Flamborough Granbrook for this question. I think the first principle of ensuring children catch up is that kids remain in class. And I'm so pleased that 73% of QP members endorsed our deal that will provide stability for families, for children, and for educational workers in the province of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
Part of our plan to catch up is very much based in a principle that literacy and numeracy are foundational skills to ensure we increase graduation rates and create better links to better paying jobs. That is our mission as a government, ensuring young people remain aspirational and bold and that they're able to achieve their full potential. That's why we launched the largest tutoring program in Canada. Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we also recognize reading is an important skill set. We saw from the Ontario Human Rights Commission the uh, right, the Rights to Read report suggests the former Liberal government's curriculum was outdated Response. and didn't follow the evidence, the science of reading. And so we reformed our language curriculum and we're ensuring every child, kindergarten to grade two, gets a screening assessment so that we improve their reading and we give them the supports they need to succeed in our economy. Speaker. The supplementary question, the member for Burlington. You know what I like? Speaker, studies from leading health experts reveal that mental health issues can start early in our young learners particularly from the age of 15 onwards. According to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, these students are more likely to experience mental health illness and substance use disorders than any other group. We know that mental health education can empower students with the knowledge, skills, and tools they need to assist in navigating their own mental health, often saving lives. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Education, how will our government commit to supporting mental health education in schools? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to first off just recognize the courage of the member from Burlington and her leadership in this legislature, ensuring students are better off. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have, since 2017-18, from the former Liberal government, we increased funding in mental health in a significant way. Was, they were spending about 16 to 18 million per year. We're now spending 90 million dollars, a 400 percent increase in expenditure to improve outcomes for children. This year, there's 10 million dollars more, Mr. Speaker. We increase learning, mandated learning for the first time in Canada and mental health from grades kindergarten all the way to grade eight. We were the first jurisdiction in the country to do that, Speaker. And we also recognize that there's a role for public health nurses, a critical role within our schools. It's why Fonts. we nearly doubled them providing mental health support. And I want to assure the member from Burlington, we will move forward with her motion to strengthen further mental health promotion, save lives and improve the lives of all children in this province. Thank you. Question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, over the past few months, we have had numerous tragic and terrifying incidents in high schools, including a number of incidents in schools across Scarborough, Speaker. Students are experiencing immense difficulty, especially after the two and a half years of virtual learning. With the lack of extracurricular activities, students, families, teachers, they're all worried, they're scared. They're worried about these students' mental health, and I know the minister just spoke about it. These students are dealing with trauma, anxiety. We've even had stabbing, shootings in our schools, resulting in deaths, multiple deaths in Scarborough. And these students, speaker, don't want to hear about a roadmap to wellness or a number. Those are great, but we need the real actions in these schools. So what they want to hear is, what are the resources in place for our youths in schools and in our communities to ensure their safety and well-being. Thank you very much. Speaker. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I think we, we all in this legislature are deeply concerned about the violence taking place near or at schools in this province and, frankly, across the country. We are shared the resolve to confront the violence with investment, with staffing and support for our schools, for our children and for our staff. Mr. Speaker, in addition to increasing funding, a roughly 420 percent increase in supports. We also have targeted community-based organizations. The Pinball Clemens Foundation, for example, Speaker, is being supported to help racialize children with sport and after-school programs. We've also ensured the Canadian Tamil Academy supports intergenerational trauma with mental health supports. The Muslim Association of Canada with new targeted supports for students and for staff dealing with mental health and bullying. We've doubled the Black Graduation Program, an amazing program that helps ensure higher success rates for racialized children. We have funded the Child Development Institute to support children with behavioral issues, and we've massively increased the Kids Help Phone. The member from Burlington has introduced a motion to call on government to do more, and I assure the member we will in the interest of saving lives, protecting children, and preventing violence in our schools. Next question, the member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Speaker, my office is working with three families facing similar struggles. Each has a child who is self-harming, has made multiple suicide attempts, and is violent at home. These families have been told their children's needs are too complex for community program options, but they can't get inpatient care. One family has been waiting months to hear about a placement in Hamilton or Niagara. The second family is waiting to go on a wait list. If a residential treatment option can be found. The third child was placed in a group home and is now using and living on the street. Speaker, will this government commit to providing appropriate treatment options in London for children with some of the highest mental health needs? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. In fact, to complement the investments that are being made in education, that are looking to assist children while they're at school. Our government is also invested in the community-based supports and services with a 5% increase across the board for children and youth services. We've looked specifically at adding additional youth wellness hubs to provide those supports to individuals, and these supports are reducing the amount of times that people need to go to emergency rooms, which means that the ones that are going that need the more acute care will have access to that. And we've invested. One of the leading causes of issues for young people, and I don't know those specific cases, is eating disorders. And those eating disorders lead to other complications, whether it be an addiction, so we've created the capacity and we are continuing to create capacity to ensure that the gaps Response. are filled and that kids, young people, have the treatment options available to them where and where they reside. Okay, the next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Speaker, with winter upon us, more people will depend on our public transit systems for safe and reliable travel. Public transit is vital service for individuals and families in many regions of our province. While we know that our government has made significant transit investments, many of my constituents are looking for assurance that our government will continue to support our transit system during this period of economic uncertainty. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please explain what our government is doing to support our transit agencies as we ensure their continued operation? Thank you. Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. That member works really hard for the people of Scarborough, and I thank him for that question. Speaker, I'm also very happy to inform that member that yesterday we announced that we are allocating up to $505 million so that municipalities can keep local transit systems alive and deliver safe, reliable transit services to the hardworking riders across this province, including those in Scarborough. Speaker, we heard from our municipal partners and we are stepping up to the plate once again with historic funding delivered through phase four of the Safe Restart Agreement. For instance, nearly $348 million is now being given to the City of Toronto to support the TTC. This is on top of the $1.2 billion we've already committed to the City and the TTC through prior Safe Restart funding. Speaker, improving the transit network isn't just about laying down track, providing discounts and more options to pay. It requires supporting transit agencies so that hardworking people can get from point A to point B uh, and do it seamlessly. Speaker. This is just the Response. beginning. With this funding, we're making sure that we protect transit. We're getting it done for commuters Great in job, this province. Yes, supplementary question. Speaker, thank you for the Associate Minister for his response. It is reassuring for many of my constituents and all Ontarians that our transit network continues to provide reliable and accessible service for those who need it most. Our government's recent funding and historic multi-billion dollar transit expansion plan will continue to assist transit riders across our province. Our transit system must continue to be responsive to our community's need. And now and in the future. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please explain what ongoing support our government is providing to our transit agencies? Thank you. 
Thank you, Speaker. The member is right. It's about supporting communities, and that means more than just creating a spider web of transit, but it also means continuing to support transit agencies throughout the province. Uh, Speaker, phase four of this funding, on top of the $2 billion that our government has already allocated since 2020 under the Federal Provincial Safe Restart Agreement, provides such support. It's historic funding, frankly, Speaker, and it kept municipal transit agencies running through a very difficult time that was the pandemic. And these most recent uh, investments will make sure we boost ridership in Scarborough as well as around the province to ensure that riders get reliably and safely to wherever it is that they need to go. Mm -hmm. Now, Speaker, it's unfortunate that the NDP and the Liberals voted against our previous safe restart funding, and given their track record, they'd probably say no to the recent $505 million. However, Speaker, unlike the opposition, we will continue to say yes to building world-class transit, yes to connecting the grid, yes to supporting transit agencies. Speaker, this is the Fonts. only government that's going to get it done for commuters in Ontario. Next, member for Spadina, Fort Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, 8,000 Ontarians with mental illness or disabilities are experiencing homelessness. 216 people experiencing homelessness died on the streets of Toronto last year. Two nights ago, I was speaking with a young man in front of a shelter, and he had been beaten up. He had a broken rib and a broken cheekbone, and he'd been discharged from the hospital, and he was sleeping on the street in front of a shelter that had just been closed. I phoned shelter services to see if they had a bed. There was nothing available. All the shelters in Toronto were full. The Minister of Children and Community Services has been boasting about a 5% increase to ODSB rates, which is actually an inflationary cut. To the Premier, are you not ashamed that your government's destitution-level ODSP rates are leading to homelessness and death for Ontarians with mental illness and disabilities? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, once again, thank you for that question. I think that question underscores something that's significant, that we need to address the social determinants of health if, in fact, we're going to make a difference and build a system and a continuum of care that's actually going to make a difference in everyone's lives that's impacted by mental health or addictions. And, Mr. Speaker, that's something that our government has been doing. We're taking a whole-of-government approach when it comes to the investments that are being made. For instance, with the Solicitor General, we're building mobile crisis intervention teams that are geared to provide supports and services to take individuals to crisis centres instead of taking them to hospital, to emergency rooms. With the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, we're working. He's doing incredible work, and he's trying through the new legislation to build even more uh, homes for individuals. You know, he's raised, he's put in, he's invested $500 million annually to, for the homelessness prevention program. And I want to quote from the CEO of Habitat for Humanity. He said, this government's proposal to exempt affordable housing from development charges will provide certainty to all affordable housing providers and enable us to build more homes. Mr. Speaker, we are going to make a difference and build a there and ensure that people are getting the supports they need when, when they need them. A supplementary question? Member for Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Times are tough and coping is hard for anyone. People also struggling with mental health issues are really up against it, with nowhere to turn and dangerous waiting lists. The Auditor General basically had said we were doing a terrible job with youth mental health back in 2018, and now, heading into 2023, we're terribly beyond capacity and things are really bad. Ashley is a young woman in my community who has spent too much time asking and waiting for help. She has a question for the Premier. She asks, quote, at Lake Ridge Health, why is the wait time to see a psychiatrist over two years long? Why does it take a trip to the emergency room in active crisis to maybe be seen sooner? It always has to escalate, but all too often folks in crisis are sent home from the ER, e home from the ER and told to wait years, end quote. So my question is Ashley's question. Why is the wait time to see a psychiatrist over two years long for youth in my community? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you for that question because it's something, the, well, the very questions and a lot of the questions that are being asked here today are the reason that I'm standing here. I'm in government because of the lack of effort from the previous government and the one before that in making the investments that needed to be made. Mr. Speaker, this is the first government. Clock. Stop the clock. First government to appoint. Meaning. 
meaning do we start the clock or not? He's talking. Start the clock. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Understanding our 15 now. The business for answer. This country and maybe the entire. the sector to ensure that the supports are there for the people that need the supports where and when they need them. And I won't take Fine. lessons from the NDP who cut who support the clock. There is a lot going on at the moment. Start the clock. The member for Niagara West. Next question. As many new Canadians and new families are moving to our beautiful region, and we also have a rapidly aging population. And combined together, these two factors are obviously uh, placing a great deal of pressure on our local health care facilities. Unfortunately, we saw the former Liberal government cancel not once but twice the new West Lincoln Memorial Hospital. Now, my question to the Minister of Infrastructure is if she could please provide an update to this House about what critical infrastructure investments are being made in health care in the Niagara region. Great. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, building hospitals is a priority for the people of Ontario. I want to thank the member from Niagara West for his hard work in helping to build key healthcare infrastructure in the Niagara region. In our most recent market update, we are advancing on the construction of our hospital, which includes South Niagara Hospital Project. Once completed, the South Niagara will be a full acute care hospital with state-of-the-art 24-7 emergency department, diagnostic, therapeutic, and surgical service. This is in addition to expanding the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital in Grimsby, which, by the way, Mr. Speaker, was the very first hospital that our government announced when we were elected in 2018. So I'm very excited that we are making progress on these two projects. Supplementary. To the minister, my thanks to the minister for visiting Niagara West to see the shovels in the ground in this important project as it proceeds. Addressing the infrastructure needs of our province today is an investment in our future prosperity and in the needs of so many new Canadians. For too long, communities across this province were neglected by the previous Liberal government, and crucial infrastructure in so many communities fell by the wayside. Key infrastructure requests were delayed, ignored, or passed over. I know that our government is committed to building the infrastructure that is needed in each and every sector and every community of our province. So, my question to, through you, Speaker, is if the minister could provide more information to this House about the investments that are being made in communities across Ontario. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We were elected on a very strong mandate to build key infrastructure across the province of Ontario. That's right. Communities like Brampton, Windsor, Durham were communities that were previously ignored by the Liberal government. Not under our watch, Mr. Speaker, in Brampton, we're building a new hospital, which will include a 24-7 Emerge Department. In southwestern Ontario, we're moving forward with the widening of Highway 3 from Essex to Leamington. And in Durham Region, Mr. Speaker, the Grandview Children's Treatment Centre in Ajax is under construction. There, is, there will be lots more to share in your 2023. That concludes our question period for this morning. I have a number of members who have asked to raise points of order. We'll deal with them one at a time. First of all, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, just rising in accordance with uh, uh, Standing Order 59. Uh, uh, just to remind members, of course, that we will re be returning on Tuesday, February 21st. And uh, as I always do, I, uh, I look forward, uh, very much look forward to uh, contacting the opposition House leaders and uh, working closely to, to uh, let them know <laughs> let them know what uh, business will be coming ahead. Uh, I also just uh, want to, on behalf of, uh, of the government, also uh, uh, congratulate and, uh, and thank uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Modest uh, for his uh, his exceptional uh, exceptional work here on behalf of you, but on behalf of all of the House. Uh, uh, it is a, a very very difficult job, a very very difficult difficult task uh, being in the House Leader's office. Even more difficult, I would suggest, being in, in the opposition House Leader's uh, office, and he has done a, an exceptionally good job. Uh, uh, of, uh, of doing it, and to his uh, wife, uh, uh, Shauna, Rhea, uh, his daughter, Rhea, and Riley, uh, uh, congratulations. Your dad has done an extraordinary, extraordinarily uh, good job, and we uh, congratulate him. 
Wish them all the best in the future. Um, also, just uh, want to uh, again, uh, Speaker, uh, thank you for a uh, what was a, a wonderful reception uh, last evening. Uh, I know that many members had a great time. It was. Uh, very, very nice to see everybody back after a, a couple of years' hiatus. To uh, all of my colleagues on all sides of the House, thank you for what was a very, very productive session and uh, uh, another uh, more great work on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario by all members on, on uh, all sides of the House and, of course, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the wonderful staff here who have done extraordinary uh, work in uh, keeping this place uh, going. We said it before, not only the only legislature that continued to sit during uh, COVID in person, a testament to their hard work, uh, but bringing us back strong and, and working very hard for us. Uh, we all thank you uh, very much for your hard work. And uh, finally, just to uh, again to my uh, my great uh, my great team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and again, all members, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, uh, Happy Holidays, and be safe. And we'll see you back uh, not so soon. <laughs> thank you. Point of order: the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I would like to invite everybody to um, go to a celebration uh, in room 230. Emancipation Month Canada will be there celebrating the one-year anniversary of the first bill in Ontario history that was co-sponsored by members of all four parties with seats in the House. So I want to give a special shout out to MPPs Kanjan, Hunter, and Lindo for being a part of that. And I hope you can all go in and wish Emancipation Month Canada well today. I'd also like to take a moment as well on behalf of the entire Green Caucus to thank Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> to thank Kevin Modesta as well. Um, you know, when we came here uh, in 2018, I had no idea how this legislature worked. And in the spirit of cross-party cooperation, Kevin was um, just an invaluable guide to me and my team in helping us navigate this place. also just want to take a moment to thank all the staff as well, from the table to custodial services, security, everyone else. Thank you for the great work you do. And a special shout out to Jackie, who sat right in front of me for the last few years for the great work you've done and wish you well in your retirement. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Ottawa South. Speaker, I'd like to correct my record and I have a few words I'd like to say after that. So on December the 6th in my late show, I'd like to correct my record uh, for Hansard. Yep, sometimes you make mistakes. The and it starts the sentence for Hansard. The review added 21 urban river valleys and 17 removals. They were approved, totaling, I meant to say, 138 acres. And then, I mean another mistake, I said, remember, you guys are opening up and I meant to say 11,000 acres. And then another mistake, this is unbelievable how many mistakes I made in this. So, and then in the 2017 plan, we expended by 9,000 hectares, which is actually, I meant to say, more than 22,000 acres. Thank you. Okay. And a second point of order. Yeah. I had a chance to say Merry Christmas yesterday, so I'm, uh, you're all here, so I'm not going to be a hog and take up too much time. I do love you all. We're all like one big family. You know that. And I, um, but I want there, there are two special thank yous um, on top of my cock, who I love most, by the way, just so you know. Kevin Modest is uh, a welcoming, smart person here in this legislature. Incredible knowledge. But the best thing about Kevin is he's got the biggest heart. And uh, I'm so uh, glad to have had spent some time with Kevin. Um, I didn't want to have to do it by coming to the opposition lobby, but it was worth it. Um, and I just want to thank him so much and really wish him well. And And yesterday, when uh, again I had the opportunity to um, hold the floor for a bit and um, talk about us being a family, there's another part of our family, which are the people who work here, 
the table, uh, the sergeant at arms, everyone, all the constables, everybody who works in this place. You know, they're, they were here before, there's some of them that were here before any of us got here. And they're going to be here after we're not here anymore because it goes past any of us. And we owe them a great debt for the things that they do every day to keep us informed, to keep us safe, to keep us organized, and to keep us in order. Very, very thankful for that. And Speaker, you're their boss, and we're very thankful for you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Point of order, the member or the minister for red tape reduction. Speaker, I just want to take a moment and recognize a few friends that are here with us from India. Uh, Bakwinder Singh, Gurmeet Kaur, Amrit Chima, Arshdeep Work. And welcome to legislature. Thank you. Member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. On behalf of the official opposition, I'd also like to take a moment. Um, and I've spoken about Kevin already. The one thing that no one's said yet is Kevin has got the most amazing sense of humor. Sometimes there's some people in this place who want to make me cry, but he always makes me laugh. <laughs> and I would also like to recognize everyone who works here, who works for the people of Ontario, and that everyone who works here does something that we couldn't operate if, we weren't, if they weren't here. You know, lots of times we're here at night and someone comes to clean the office, the people in the cafeteria, once again, I couldn't survive without the cafeteria. But it, it's, it's an incredible place. So on behalf of the official opposition, I'd like to wish everyone uh, Joyeux Noël, Merry Christmas, and for my Dutch friends, Greta Kekestaga. Thank you. The President of the Treasury Board, that appointed... Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to give an introduction to Dr. Uh, David Jacobs, who is here today, and thank him for all the incredible work he does uh, as a medical professional and for, for everyone across this province. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 51.